Um, I, I did have one comment from from last week. Um, at times, um, both from uh, our class and also from a couple of rather disturbing conversations that I, I had with uh, some people, we sometimes as Catholics tend to become somewhat insular so that we're really not very well connected to or very well aware of what's going on in broader Christianity. Um, so one of the things that that, uh, that I would recommend doing is either going to a black church or going to a Catholic church with a large black population. So for example, Immaculate Conception in Seattle has a fairly, uh, has a sizable black population. Uh, there are a fairly large number of black parishioners and their presence has clearly affected worship in the church. So that's a, a really good, um, good, um, thing to do. Um, in terms of insularity, I, 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 th this is partly irrelevant, but in some ways not irrelevant. We tend to, in some sense, form a, a silo. And so we're kind of unaware of. So uh, I, I have had a couple of, of discussions over the last few weeks, uh, one with a person who told me he was going to Bible study. And, and I said, oh, we have Bible study at, at SJV. And he said, oh, no, don't worry. This Bible study, it's not Catholic, but this Bible study is non-denominational. And, and similarly, just recently had a conversation in which somebody said, uh, my, my children aren't going to Catholic church, but at least they're going to, they're going to a non-denominational church. So that's good. It's non-denominational. Does anyone know what non-denominational non means? Well, it's just, they don't identify as any particular brand, so to speak, like Lutheran or Methodist, but it's just sort of hodgepodge, right? Uh, no, not completely. It's a marketing term. Oh, okay. So non-denominational means evangelical fundamentalist. You know, oh, so it means, yeah. means every word of the Bible is literally true. It means you know, that there's going to be a rapture, which is a heresy in the Catholic Church. It means that um, the Eucharist, no, not the Eucharist. There is no Eucharist. Communion is purely symbolic. It's a, a symbol of our unity as a people of God, but you know, completely unrelated to, to the cross. Jesus is certainly not present in communion. It's, you know, bread and, bread and grape juice. So in any case, that, that insularity is sort of a, a good thing to, to, you know, sort of try to break down and, you know, sort of to be curious about what our separated brethren are doing, um, even you know, not not to say that you have to approve of it, which you know I generally don't. But it's good to know, you know, um, what the other currents of American Christianity are. So for tonight, were were there any? Reactions to the reading? Any thoughts or comments before we sort of formally begin? I'm really enjoying the the way he writes. I mean, it's easy to glean and um, get thought provoking, um, but I have to say I'm a little embarrassed, saddened uh, that this stuff is like, why did I never know this before? Mm -hmm. The way that the constitution is so ingrained. And I mean, of course, it, it always felt like a uh, white male, you know, and, and, 
but not, I don't know, I can't express it. Uh, it's just more, even more, um, even more suppressive than, than I ever thought about before. Uh -huh. uh, but like I said, I, I, I'm happy to be reading this. I think it's pretty easy to understand and um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how we can get more people to to study that part of it and not call it critical race theory that everybody's against, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, the problem, I mean, the condemnation of critical race theory is a desire to embrace falsehood at the expense of lies. Yeah. And, you know, when people choose to embrace falsehood and lies, there's really nothing, not much that can be done to, to dissuade them unless, you know, I mean, uh, it really takes the con a confrontation with the Holy Spirit uh, to recognize that lies are indeed lies and that Satan is the author of lies. But the Constitution, uh, the Constitution is a good place to start with a somewhat tangential, but not completely tangential question. So many Christians praise strict constructionists who interpret the Constitution within the literal context of its time, discuss the implications of this. Strict constructionism has become a major theme. Yeah, I, I um. I would, I would just throw in that I, I never understood why they couldn't, people who say that can't realize that the Constitution is a rather a living document. It has amendments um, that for two, what is it, 200 years ago, uh, a lot of things were different than they are now. And obviously, should be interpreted should be interpreted as the situation is now mm -hmm. it just doesn't it blows my mind you have somebody as smart and, and intelligent and so forth as as Antonin Scalia interpreting things as they were in 1779 or whatever although well, I have to agree uh, sometimes of gnashing my teeth I did have to agree sometimes on his, his um, decisions, you know, even though I didn't like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't understand what the uh, implications would be um, that it's Christians who are thinking this way. I'm, I'm kind of at a loss there. Wouldn't it be a lot of different people could think that it's, way? It is a lot of different people, but it also is a major, you know, sort of current within, among Christians to elect us to a, uh, Vote for candidates who will appoint a conservative Supreme Court. Well, yeah, and um, and so those are strict constructionists, and so you know we end up with um, people like Clarence Thomas, and and uh, I mean we well, we have two sex two accused sex offenders on on the Supreme Court. We have a lot of gun rights people. Um, we have people who are committed to racism. Um, we have you know, a very, at this point, a very uh, troubling majority. Yes, I agree with you there. But don't, don't, from what I'm sort of observed, the Christians who are applauding all that are usually applauding it from the point of view of the abortion issue. They they aren't saying, oh my goodness, guns you know sh well, guns are a terrible thing and that's a violence. Well, so they they don't even seem to care about all that. Guns as well. Guns are a part of. Um, well, that's true. Some yeah. parts of Christian culture, sure. yeah. in a major way. After the Constitution, Tisby discusses race based chattel slavery. So he talks about how slaves had, um, the bodies of slaves had a measurable value. 
So men are valued for their labor and their productivity, although slave labor isn't terribly productive. And women were valued both for their labor or productivity and for their reproductive ability. So one can buy a slave, and if the slave is a woman, she can reproduce and one ends up with free slaves. And then, of course, since slaves are property, women can be raped. Um, there are no, it's not a crime to destroy your property. So if you kill your slave, that's not a problem. So slaves had a measurable value. Does anyone see a problem with this and a way in which it's idolatrous? Well, I mean, they're treating, they're treating people like animals, literal animals. I mean, you know, how is this sow, a healthy sow? Is this, does this bull, is he strong enough to impregnate my herd? You know, I mean, that, those animals have measurable value and it's, it looks to be the same way that slaves are being mm -hmm. looked at. And of course, from a Christian point of view, um, you're taking a human being who's made in the image and likeness of God and treating that human being as non-human. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, so slaves have a measurable value, what do white people have? <laughs> I mean, what is their value? value? by implication. Well, they get to judge, right? They're the judges. Yeah. They're, they're making the call on, mm -hmm. so that in itself is is wrong. Again, right, the, the, the system is set up in their favor, favor, but what is their value? I think they're, they're like complete. They're like a complete person. They're a hundred percent. They're not two thirds. Yeah. Three right. fifths. I was three fifths, so they're five fifths. Right, it's three <laughs> they're fifths. Five fifths. Right. <laughs> so, so their their value is immeasurable, mm -hmm. right? Their value is immeasurable. So we have people with a measurable value and people whose value is immeasurable. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Immeasurable value, measurable value. The way women were looked at. That's I'll be true. honest with you, in, in my studies in history and all, where they would get to that part of the Constitution about, um, you know, that it was white written for white men, et cetera. They would always talk about women being excluded. Very rarely was it mentioned about Black people being excluded. Right, right. That's true. Yeah. But where in theology do we encounter immeasurable value and measurable value? Does anyone know? No. So the nature of sin, why are we called to forgive one's and one another's sins? Not because it's nice necessarily, or we because we should, but it's because a sin, the, 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 um, the gravity of the sin is measured by the dignity of the being against whom one commits the sin. So as humans, we are finite. And so when we commit a sin against our brother or sister, it's a finite sin. The capacity to repay the sin is determined by the attribute of the person who has committed the sin or offense. So we are finite beings. When we sin against our brother or sister, we've committed a finite sin, and as 
people who are ourselves finite, we can make recompense for it. God is infinite. Therefore, when we sin against God, we've committed an infinite offense. When we, um, because we're finite, we ourselves have no means of ever repaying that offense. Finite cannot atone or repay, recompense the infinite. That's why Jesus died on the cross. So you see the point of all of this? This is a, an appropriation for white people of the privileges that are reserved exclusively for God. Wow. So what this is, is idolatry. I mean, the Constitution is idolatry. No, I mean, chattel-based slavery and in general racism. Oh, 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 okay. Racism. I, I'm sorry, I we moved on from the Constitution. Yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure where the, yeah, okay. Oh, well, I can understand that, yeah. Definitely a sin against God. So, so is that is that clear? Not only is it a sin, it's the worst of sins. It's a form of idolatry. Is that clear? Murky? I'm, I'd like it to, you state it out just a little more. The You're saying that um, endorsing, so to speak, shadow-based slavery, we are, we are sinning. We are, I mean, for those who did that, or do that, um, it is the sin of idolatry. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like you to kind of connect that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's go back to Jesus calls us to forgive our neighbor. Right. He calls us to forgive our neighbor. I mean, you know, we should do it. It's a nice thing to do. It's kind of, if we want to be forgiven, we should forgive others and kind of tit for tat. And that's all true, but that doesn't actually really, that really misses the point of what Jesus is saying. Um, what he's saying is that our, we are finite. The sins again that we uh, commit against one another are finite. Because they're finite, they can be repaid because a finite person commits a sin against a finite person. God is infinite. And so when we sin against one another and we expect forgiveness of God and we refuse to forgive our brother and sister, the problem isn't intrins intrinsically our own unforgiveness. The problem intrinsically is that we're refusing to forgive <clears throat> a finite sin when we expect God to forgive an infinite sin. And that requires chutzpah. That is basically the same thing. I mean, there's a a Jewish joke about the definition of chutzpah is uh, a child murders his parents and then throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. So, so that's, that's chutzpah. So how does this relate to slavery? In slavery, white people elevate themselves to occupy the position of having immeasurable value. But in reality, only God can have immeasurable value. And so that means that white people in a chattel-based, slavery-based system uh, 
are assuming the role of God. They're assuming that they have infinite value and that others have value less than them. But only God has value that is greater than any of us. So, so in, in endorsing, participating in that slavery system, the, um, the white person is He's assuming in place of God. So, so he's sinning against God because he's sinning. He's idolizing himself. I mean, is that how we would put it? Rather than God, he's putting himself in the place of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, of course, would be idolatry. Um, yeah. Unless. All right. But, but what about, what about the, when you keep saying finite against finite, if, oh, well, what makes it different, I guess? It, the, the white person is sinning against the black person by being by the cruelty and, uh, and so forth and so forth. And mm. since they are both finite, it's possible that that sin could be forgiven. I mean, we're talking theoretical here now. <laughs> um, but but they be it, so. But but the the white person assuming such a greater value of him or herself is it makes the sin infinite because that's putting themselves in the place of God. I mean, if I went down the street and punched somebody in the nose, that's a finite sin. Right. Uh -huh. All right. I yeah. mean, of course, to my mind, I've never really made such a distinction. I haven't studied enough theology, I guess, because for me, if I sin against, you know, I mean, that's sinning against God because sin is always against God. It's against what God commands. So I'm, I'm, didn't know the fine the uh, more in um, it's against what god commands but not directly yes. but when we not, elevate not, our not. when we elevate ourselves to the position of god yeah that's i see the difference then it is directly yeah so, okay i can see that yeah so idolatry by its by its nature involves elevating something to the position of or a position greater than god and, and devaluating, devaluing the lives of slaves to think that they're less than human elevates oneself to the position of God. And since we aren't God and have no right to elevate ourselves to the position of God, that's a form of idolatry. Okay. It's sort of like the question um it, it isn't a question of whether there is or isn't a god it's a question of who is your god like alcohol can be your god um, mm -hmm. uh, an inordinate lust and sex can be your god um doing crossword puzzles can be your god if it if it overtakes your life so much that 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 comes first yeah so so being being the, the total and complete master better than anyone else all, you know controls your life then that is that's your god so that is idolatry yeah mm -hmm. the chapter spends a good deal of time on the very muted opposition to slavery often especially from from the church uh, so one of the the things he discussed was the American Colonization Society. The American Colonization Society was part of a more general movement that um, viewed slavery as, well, especially viewed free slaves as problem, uh, slaves who had been freed as problematic and also felt that if something could be done to deal with the problem of free slaves who were seen as dangerous or not fitting very well into society, then possibly more slave owners would manumit their slaves. And so the result was this idea that we would either send uh, former slaves back to Africa, or that we would 
um, create room for them, particularly on the Pacific coast. So why did they do that? They, he, they did suggest that they didn't think they'd be able to integrate into American society. So they thought that, that maybe sending them back to Africa with you know, some Christian <coughs> concepts that they could then ev evangelize Africa, right? That was sort mm -hmm. of a short take, but right. uh, very strange. Yeah, right. they were <coughs> they were um, dangerous here. They didn't integrate well mm -hmm. and had no real place in society, nor could they ever hope to find one. But they could go to Africa and improve the the uh, overall state of the area in which they settled. The, one of the early pro proposals was to settle them on the west coast, or you know, in the Great Plains, or you know, sort of an unsettled area. But then it was feared that they would unite with the, the Native Americans and, and other people and become you know, a problem uh, of social order. They, they might become you know, rebels and, uh, and lead attacks on, on uh, white people and undermine the established order. And so sending them to Africa was the best uh, alternative. That's where the country of Liberia, right? It was in the um, Yeah. Was it? Uh -huh. Some of them were sent to, I'm not sure how they picked it and all, all the details of it. The country of Liberia was formed. Right, Liberia and also Sierra Leone. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Was established as a, a um, migration colony by the British. Does this sound familiar? I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Send them to Africa. Similar to what? Send them to Africa. Send them to Africa. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Native American reservations. True. Put them, put them all together in their or, own place yeah. away although, from us. <laughs> although this is, yeah, although this is, you know, putting them a bit further away. Did the church do something like this? I'm trying to think if the church did something like I'm this. I'm pretty sure it was Abraham Lincoln. I could be wrong. Dad. Uh, yeah, I think but, it has been discussed at different times and I, I think Abraham Lincoln might be. That was one of the alternatives. Um, more recently. Well, that's back over the border, send them back to Mexico. Oh, right, right, yeah. But sending them, yeah, sending them back to Mexico. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that is more recent. Well, also, black football players taking knees. It's very threatening. <laughs> They should go back to where they came from, which send them back to Africa. If they don't like it here, they should go back to Africa. I've, I've heard that from, in fact, a number of people in our church. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh. So what's wrong with that? Well, if they're born here, they're American citizens, right? So this is where they come from, right? right. I mean, e e even Asian people run into this too, you know. You right. speak English so well, well, shoot, I'm <laughs> born and bred here, you know? I mean, it's uh, somebody who would say that must have such a deep racist vein running through them, they don't probably even realize it. But that's just blows my mind when people tell stories of that. So does anyone see the element of chutzpah here? Yep. <laughs> we're, be we're better. White America is, well, how, how would you do that? It's, it's not only that we're better, 
we weren't here in the first place. That's true. And so why shouldn't we be sent back to where we came from? Right. <laughs> there you go. And, and at least most of our ancestors came by choice. And there were a few indentured servants, I guess, but most came by choice, whereas the Black people did not come by right, choice. Did not come by choice. Right. Yeah, and the interesting thing in terms of, of the American Colonization Society and, and you know that whole debate at the time is that it was seen as being um, benevolent and compassionate. I can't you know, see so that. So we we uprooted the slaves. We took them out of Africa, where you know they were happy and whatever, and we brought them here to horrible conditions with slavery, and you know we uprooted their lives, and now they've been set free, and they don't fit into society, and they can't can't fit into society here. So we'll do the compassionate thing and send them back. So it's it very was, similar to what we did with Native Americans too. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we needed, we discovered America and then we had to move them. Um, and I think it was kind of decided they too couldn't be, they, they needed to be on reservations or they, you know, they needed to be removed because they weren't, they weren't interested in doing what we wanted them to do. Mm -hmm. The farming, yeah. things like that. Um, and that was the. I guess that in in our minds that had to have been the the correct answer. Mm -hmm. Right, and so yeah, and so people felt very good about it, like they were, um, you know, doing a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and it also was very heavily a Christian movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the um, Finley, Robert Finley, who, who Tisby uh, mentions, focuses on and discussed in the American Colonization Society was a Presbyterian minister. It's just occurring to me, um, the fact that Catholics in colonial America and probably you know, for a good while, were kind of persona non grata too, mm -hmm. um, to a great extent. Um, is that would that be why the church? I I don't. I'm not sure how much, and maybe it's in the reading I haven't gotten to yet. But has the Catholic Church participated in this kind of benevolent um, treatment of black people? Of course. I know the Jesuits at Georgetown had slaves, you know, and all right. that, and, and, right. and that's not good, and they should have thought it through, but they didn't. But before Georgetown, before when, when Catholics were still a little iffy and they could only live in Maryland or something, <laughs> um, is there any record of them sort of joining their Protestant brethren, so to speak, in forming these, these ideas of like, like the Liberian and so forth? We're, or are we just sort of keeping our heads down? And... Well, no, the, I mean, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, most of the, um, most of the participation in, in the American Colonization Society seems to have been um, uh, Presbyterian and, and other Protestants, although, mm -hmm. um, you know, Catholics certainly owned slaves. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't a, a particularly great, you know, opposition to slavery. When, when the, the Jesuits sold uh, a, sig a significant number of slaves in, I don't remember, something like 1833, they, they, they sold uh, slaves in, I think, like, four lots, three small numbers, and then a significant sale of a huge number of slaves 
in about 1833 or, or something. Mm -hmm. Actually, it has to have been later. Um, in, in, um, uh, it's shortly before 1844 since the, I think in 1844, I don't remember who the Pope was, um, released an encyclical declaring that the slave trade was a mortal sin. Ah, I did not and know that. Before the encyclical, he recalled the, the, the superior of the Jesuit order who had sold the slaves. Mm. Interesting. Um, but th there was also, you know, among especially near the end of the antebellum period, as as the Irish settled in um, New England, particularly, and well, on the Mid Atlantic, um, the the Irish tended to be. Well, not necessarily. Um, well, tended to be pro-slavery, or tended to be anti-black, especially mm -hmm. since they saw blacks as, you know, competition for jobs for themselves. Right. And so exactly. there was a, a good deal of racism in the the early Catholic Church in America. The Almighty Dollar rules so much, you know. You can find it at the bottom of a lot of stuff. Right, right. Right, where money is concerned, morality often goes out the window. The window. Mm -hmm. Which leads to the next question, for which this is a partial answer. What factors led Christian churches to compromise what should have been moral outrage of slavery to instead embrace slavery? or in the case of abolitionists like Charles Finney to embrace racism without slavery. Oh. So Finney was the president of Oberlin College and I think he was also, he was either a Presbyterian or a Methodist minister. So he allowed women and blacks to attend Oberlin. Um, Oberlin has always been you know, sort of an elite small school. So he allowed women and blacks to attend Oberlin. He was an abolitionist, so he opposed the existence of slavery. And yet his, in his church, the, his, his congregation was segregated racially. And, uh, and he, he opposed race mixing. He still limited it though, right? They're like, they couldn't be in the leadership roles. Yeah, right. that's what I was thinking. Leadership roles, yeah. Right? Yeah. But at least it's a step, right? Compared to everyone else. Um, is it? I mean, I'm not sure that you know, when we begin to look at small steps in many ways, you know, we tend to condone large parts of the system and, and the underlying, you know, the underlying principle here is that people aren't equal. Yeah, and even though it's a step, it really reinforced that. Yeah, too. yeah. And, and it's also going back to chutzpah. <laughs> Remember that women are property, slave women are property, black women are property. They're the property of the landowner, of the slave owner. And it was extremely common for slave owners to have sex with their slave slaves yep. who then bore children. So large numbers of African Americans are actually of mixed descent mm -hmm. yeah. because they had 
white slave owner parents or uh, you know, a white slave owner father who raped his slave. So the notion you know, that in some form race mixing is unacceptable is at one level is you know, both hypocritical and at some level absurd what it really uh, is, what it really objects to is the right of a black person or a person of color to choose their mate because white men did it regularly I mean, purely for sex, obviously, but white men regularly raped their female slaves. Thomas Jefferson is the, the main one that comes to, to mind. Right. Because, of course, he treated, I believe he treated that slave more as a mistress than a so right. He was right. raping. I mean, that's they're, they're still raping because the power is definitely there. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But yeah. There are, there are, I have heard some black people make comments to the effect that if a person is truly, really deep, dark black, then that person is mostly authentic black. Everybody is just the lighter skin. They've got white blood in them. <coughs> I mean, they've said that, and they can, there almost can be sometimes in within the black community, or at least at some point, maybe not so much now, I don't know, but. Um, um, prejudice, um, that's the word I want to use. Um, you know, I'm better than you are because I don't have any white blood in me or something like that within the black community. You can have that kind of- It's, um, it's usually the other way around. Lighter skin is, is preferable. And, and it's, not only, it's not only within the black community, it's also true within the Asian community. Given the the, the prevalence of, of white racism uh, as a world system. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we, I think we find it among all people of color. We, we find it actually among um, Indians as well. It, it can be really, really, I mean, not Native Americans, I mean, right. Indian, Indian. Yeah, they, yeah, if you read, if you read Cass, if you read Cass, yeah, that, she, she really goes into that. She says that our Black people are the Dalits. Yeah. You know, but the India, they're the Dalits are the untouchables, and here the Black people are that, that there are castes in America. And, mm -hmm. yeah. So why did the Christian church embrace slavery? Mm -hmm. One of the things, obviously, is economics. Yeah. But that's not the only thing. Well, was it was it an attempt to um, convert them? Could it to or that, that's being too optimistic, I suppose. <laughs> but because it, it that's what was done. Maybe I mean not that that certainly doesn't justify it, but that's what was done. You need someone to be your, your handyman, your person to do all the work. You you bought a slave. Of course, Dr. I think Luther I'm King calculated eight hundred. Was it eight hundred billion that that we owe to all the slaves for what they've done? Mm -hmm. It's amazing, right? When you see those numbers with, I think it was, um, I had this, uh, I could send this interesting um, chart to you guys if you're interested, 4 million. So it was kind of a, then it's, yeah, it has just in, uh, like um, statistics and just numbers and percentages of the effects of the economy that slavery had on the economy, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Four million slaves. Mm -hmm. So economics, which means both that um, slaves are a source of profit, and also that given that 
slave labor is um, is unproductive, the more you depend on it, the more you lock yourselves into depending on it. And, and it looks like it's very profitable because all of your costs are largely up front. And you know, with with a, a female slave, you can actually produce new slaves for which you don't have to pay the upfront cost. So that looks very attractive. But there's more than the economics. What 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 else is there? Well, I think the church's the church's goal or mission is to make them all Christians. And so I think that's the compromise. They I don't think I don't know how much the church is interested in the economics of it. I think it's the compromise. We get to make them all Christians. You get to make a lot of money off of them. Also remember that there's a fixed mindset. I mean, so you know, Finney is probably a good example of that. He is an abolitionist and yet he's a racist. Mm -hmm. So he comes with this, you know, sort of mindset of my rights and I'm better than, and I'm part of a group that's better than. And, uh, you know, although that sort of mindset has, that, that mindset is just as present with us today as it was then, it's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, explicitness of it and the you know boldness of its pronouncement mm -hmm. has faded into the background and so you know people who would kind of say that openly are are seen as you know being uh the worst of white supremacists and indeed they are the worst of white supremacists but they're in some sense only the visible portion of a much deeper problem which is that there's this mentality of white privilege. Mm -hmm. There's this assumption that that uh, the privileges that there are privileges that whites should have over other people. There are ways in which whites are better than other people. Mm -hmm. And there are ways in which when whites meet obstacles or meet challenges that those are happening to them because someone else namely people of color are being privileged at their expense so that's you know a lot of the rage of poor whites against people of color I'm poor because they're being given handouts. Mm. Also as a scapegoat, right? Like for many legal issues and criminal mm -hmm. situations. Not, not, not only, you know, not only in the criminal justice system, although that's true, but you know, more broadly, you know, if we look at so it wasn't discussed in our hasn't been discussed in our, our readings i mean vaguely touched on but in one of the uh, the readings the, of on the evangelization of native americans there one of our readings was sort of about the uh fear of native americans and the fear of being killed and you know, the, the, the desire to evangelize and to make good Native Americans. And, and so there's this, this kind of, um, this fear mixed with a, you know, completely inaccurate sense of who people are. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, on the one hand we see an enormous amount of fear of black uprisings, of black revolts, of black uh, um, of black slaves murdering their masters. Um, which reminds me, does, does anyone 
No, Anderson Cooper. I know who he is. Yeah, he's a CNN uh, mm -hmm. reporter. His one of his relatives was a slave owner who was beaten to death by a with by a hose by his slaves. My word. And, and so, so the uh, uh, he was. I don't remember. He, he was being. Speaking with the historian, I think it, I don't remember. His last name is Gates. He's a really eminent black historian. Uh, so he asked Anderson Cooper what he thought of that, and Amber, Anderson Cooper said he deserved it. <laughs> he was shocked and delighted. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. he was shocked and delighted. Delighted. Yeah, but so. But so with the slaves, there's on the one hand this fear, and, and you know, there's, there's, um, I don't, I think Herbert Aptheker, who was a, um, a um, American historian, wrote in roughly, I think, the 40s, uh, what was then a pioneering study called American Negro Slave Revolts. He identified about 250 uprisings of mm -hmm. blacks, of slaves um, against their masters, uh, uprisings being 10 or more people joining together. And uh, subsequently, historians have sort of expanded it, really basically only slightly, to as many as 313 cases. Um, but so that's, you know, given the severity of, you know, an uprising, that's a fairly significant number. So we have on the one hand that, and that created a real fear. But on the other hand, we have this, um, this depiction of the slave. They're slow witted, they're lazy, um, they're docile. So you notice that the contradiction here, yeah. they're capable of revolting, but they're <laughs> docile. So none of these things are actually true. And to the extent that they are true, you know, so for example, slave labor is unproductive because people have no interest, will try to work as little as possible because they're slaves. Yeah. You'd have to be stupid. They have no skin in the game, so to speak. Yeah, you'd have to be stupid to not to to you know work harder than you need to. So we have all of these, you know, sort of we have this picture of the happy slave, mm. which happy, stupid, docile, um, not very intelligent, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And all of those stereotypes have come down to us. They still persist, and, and they still very much form uh, the impression of what is a black person. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, especially did so in in the period of slavery. Christianity was their source of strength, right? Right. At the same time, they- At the same time, right. It's amazing. So how did that, you know, sort of contradiction arise? On the one hand, for the oppressors, Christianity was a means of oppression. Mm -hmm. For the oppressed, Christianity was a means of liberation. Yeah. So how did that happen? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if I read it in here, but the slave owners felt that if they Christianized their slaves, uh, you know, with the Christian things of don't do anything bad to other people and, you know, be good. And, and St. Paul says slaves, obey your masters, you know, I mean, so forth like that, uh, that, that it was a, a method of control. But a lot of the slaves found, found liberation in their 
they they saw Moses leading the people out of up to the promised land and, and a lot of Negro spirituals are um if I can I guess it's okay to call them that uh, of ha have that theme of 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 a Bible based liberation or the Lord is the carriage chariot is coming for me and so forth like that you know right so and yeah. and even if it didn't work out as liber actual liberation, it gave them something to look forward to, to hang on to, that there was a heaven for them, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. Although I, I think I'm the promise sure was, was, I think that was accurate. I, I think the promise was much, I mean, the promise was both, but there was a heavy emphasis on, on the, um, on the here and now and not you know a deferral to to heaven oh okay well i mean yeah I, you know i i think it obviously is going to to vary and sort of differ but um it, it, it's somewhat striking that that um nat turner clearly considered himself to be a prophet and so he was looking for prophetic signs you know for when he should be signs from god for when he should begin his rebellion and and he found the sign in i, I forget either a solar or a lunar eclipse mm -hmm. which told him you know that it was time to begin his rebellion and kill the slave owners and so they they thus began Nat Turner's rebellion. Um, you know, so on the one hand, we have for the for the slave owners, and and many slave owners, in fact, resisted Christianization, and they resisted. And if they didn't resist Christianization, they often certainly resisted things like Bible study or teaching slaves literacy. Right. Yeah. For sure. Um, but where there was Christianization, so their emphasis was on what on going to heaven. Yeah, so, you know, there's the eternal reward if you you. Um, and that this is kind of you know I mean it's, it's this is sort of an interesting thing because ostensibly you know for Protestantism. Uh, a basis of Protestantism is sola fides, right? You're saved by faith alone, and some works don't really enter into it. And so there's some internal state of faith that you know is either uh, a result of God's grace or a result of. I mean, denominationally it varies, but. Here, the message is really very much kind of a works-based one. If you're good, you know, mm -hmm. and you obey the master and, you know, whatever, don't make waves and work hard and do all of that stuff and be a good slave, then you're going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's very much works-based, <laughs> which is to say, you know, that they're hypocrites since they're supposed to believe in sola fides, which, you know, doesn't require works. Well, it's different. That's because they're, they're so good, but the, the black person, it requires work. <laughs> That's true, right. They simply have faith. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you're, yeah, that's a, a good observation. So, we talked earlier about you know sort of the damage done by the theology of salvation while discarding the theology of creation and here we see the sole focus on the theology of salvation right. so the only thing that matters is that you personally go to heaven and you can do it if you are docile at the same time Many missionaries, evangelists taught literacy. 
Mm -hmm. And um, literacy then becomes a really powerful weapon in the hands of the enslaved. It's one of the major ways in which they resisted. They learned to read and to write. So, I think in some states it was illegal. You actually were breaking the law if you taught your slaves to read and write. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, so how then was Christianity used, molded by the slaves? It seems to me, it seems to me that it would be what would get me through the day. The, the whole idea that, that there was a power of love that was caring for me in spite of the fact that apparently that power couldn't do anything to keep me from getting beating, beaten, etc. But it would be something that would get me through the day. That Jesus loves me, you know, the because the Bible tells me so. I mean, there's a very simple understanding of Christianity, no worry about theological fine points and so forth. I feel That's like in a lot of ways, um, slaves found Jesus as a savior, a suffering savior, a savior um, whose life in some ways was paralleled with their own struggles. Mm -hmm. So they fell in love with God and his scripture because I feel like they really found salvation um, from reading those, from their sins and just feeling at peace with, you know, no matter what was going on in their lives, there was a God who in many ways had a similar life and they could at least connect to something. Right. Yeah. Didn't we read earlier that a lot of the slaves, or many of them that came, came already had some spiritual background? Oh yeah, they mm -hmm. came from from civilizations. They they came from well ordered societies. They weren't just running through the jungle pulling bananas off the trees. Actually, I mean it's amazing. And if you read if you read that book, um. Home going, uh, home going by, um, I can't remember now. It's, it's a fascinating story of how the slaves were captured, recruited, how they were turned over by their own leaders because they were en enemies from a different tribe. Um, but but the, the description of, of the societal structures, you know, yeah. And, and of course, because we are so wonderful and we are so perfect, anybody who looks like that couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly have an ordered society. They're just animals who happen to have human traits, you know what I'm saying? So that's when, that is why they were treated like that over here. But they came from, they came from, from ordered societies. Actually, that, that's a, that's a good point. Some of the slaves were already Christians. True, true. Africa had been, you know, it was Christianized very early. I mean, you know, we have we have the Coptics. We have, um, I mean, we have Athanasius was was black. Saint Augustine was was he a Berber? I think he was black. I've, I've always understood that to be the case, but I may be wrong. He either was black or he he was was Arab. In any case, he was he was certainly dark skinned. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where Julius Africanus came from, but I mean, I, I think he came from from Central Africa. Um, but he was one of the uh, outstanding early church fathers. So, so 
there's this this assumption that Christianity was completely foreign, and that's not necessarily the case. And that also, you know, tends to reinforce, I guess, what you know, the non-salvation only view of of uh, of Christianity. Um, and so we have that. We have the person of Jesus who suffered, died, and whose life in many ways resembles what the, the, the slaves can relate to as their lives. And obviously Jesus comes out victorious. So that becomes a source of hope. Right. And then you alluded to it, Mary, there's the exodus. What well, is a big part of their theology of their uh, yeah? What is the exodus about? It's that God hears the cry, God not only hears the cry of the oppressed, God answers the cry of the oppressed, and God favors the oppressed over the oppressors. And then we have then we have uh, you know the prophetic message. Uh, particularly for Jews and the diaspora. Mm -hmm. God will reunite us. God will destroy the oppressors. There's a real message of hope and a real message of, of liberation. And, and that liberation runs, that, that message of liberation really runs throughout both the Old Testament, particularly the prophetic books of the Old Testament right. and the New Testament. So Christianity became a really powerful weapon for the slaves and for freed blacks in their struggle against slavery and for human dignity at the same time that ironically the there's the slave owners <clears throat> were using thought they were using it as a means of oppression and a means of of reinforcing of reinforcing slavery right so that basic division has still persists i mean that's really what divides the the black church, the black evangelical church from the white evangelical church. They're very, very different. They have uh, the black evangelical church does not focus solely on the, the theology of salvation. It just is, it's one thing to focus on, but not the only thing to focus on. The white evangelical church focuses exclusively on the theology of salvation. It's the only thing there is. What's important is whether you or I, well, let me, what's important is that I go to heaven. <laughs> if you get there, we'll talk, but it doesn't matter if you don't. <laughs> right, no, oh, not, <laughs> not, not my problem. Not my problem, right. But still, it doesn't quite, to me, answer what are the factors that led the Christian church to compromise? What would have led the Christian church to compromise? Because and that would include Catholics as well. Um, Outside of economics. I know we said economics, but are, are there any other things? Yeah, but, well, I mean, we, we also talked about the mindset, you know, the, the kind of, uh, of white privilege, which uh, is um, you know they didn't consider that simple. That it was okay to be a privileged white. And, yeah, I, mean, I mean, because of the, of the times in which they live, to their mind, it's okay for us to be privileged. Well, we are privileged. Why they could they could you know they weren't outraged that blacks are we being are, we are privileged were because we're civilized and others aren't. Others don't yeah. conform to our standard of civilization 
we have this fixed notion of what civil of what civilization is and those who don't conform to it I mean you know blacks in Africa were civilized Native Americans were civilized yeah, they had their yeah. civilizations just didn't correspond to the to the white English West European <laughs> To, you know, to, to the West European model. The Western European version. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and that, you know, th that sort of sense of white privilege and, and whites being superior persists. I think at some point I I sent out the link to, to that article about uh, white privilege being sort of a bag of, of unearned um, uh privileges or unmerited privileges mm -hmm. you know, so when we as white people when we go into the store we expect that we can go into the store and shop right nobody's going to be following us nobody is going to be making sure that we we don't steal anything that's a huge privilege when you know mm -hmm. we get pulled over for speeding we don't assume that police are going to come at us with guns drawn. I mean, they're not going to do it, in fact, right. unless we do something pretty outrageous. And it generally has to be very outrageous, right. as opposed to for Black people, it has to be absolutely nothing. nothing. All they right. need to do is see a Black person being the driver, and that's you know sufficient in many cases. And I mean, there's a whole long list of those. I mean, you know, when we buy band-aids, we can be fairly sure that they kind of match our skin color, more or less. People of color can't do that. There, there are just all of these tiny and major privileges that are kind of baked in to being a white person that we assume just kind of are the way things should be. And when we have these fixed assumptions about the way things should be, we rarely question our fixed assumptions and rarely see that our fixed assumptions are typically invalid. Mm -hmm. They're typically degrading of somebody. They typically elevate ourselves to a position that we don't deserve and shouldn't be in. Right. And, and so, you know, there's both the economics, there's, uh, there's, there's the economics, there's that fixed mindset that yeah, breeds racism, and there's an element of fear, and also a lack of courage. You know? True, true. Don't upset the court, yeah. Right, don't upset, the, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if you become outspoken, nobody is going to like you very much if you yeah and, and yeah and in the case of this mr finney people who would be upset with him allowing women and blacks to go into the college he could point to the fact that blacks and whites don't sit together in my church you know so in other words yeah he could kind of and of course, they, they didn't because he felt that was right, but it was also be a talking point for him. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Amazing. Yeah, there was another, there was another um, um, evangelist, I don't remember his name, who um, I think he actually was the founder of the American Bible Society, which still exists today. Mm -hmm. um, he devoted a great deal of effort to um, educating Black pastors mm. and um, and you know and training them to evangelize and spread the gospel among. Blacks, but he was very, he, he was one of the proponents of the, you know, send them to Africa movement. And, you know, he was very careful to, to view, you know, to cast his evangelization 
within the context of not threatening slavery. Right. Although, of course, it ultimately does threaten slavery because he's empowering black pastors with a message that they, you know, that, that they is adapted to their situation. That, you know, isn't necessarily the same as the message that he's helping to indoctrinate into everybody. Uh, is there, one of the uh, kind of paradoxes that always produces change is that the oppressors always assume that they have rigorous and absolute control over the oppressed and that the oppressed are too stupid to see that they're being oppressed. And so in the process, they frequently provide the oppressed with the tools to resist their oppression. <laughs> they do it, you know, you usually do it completely willingly and unknowingly. And so you know, for the slaves, Christianity was one of the tools. And then, you know, the, there were kind of the other ones made ready to hand, like resisting work, doing as little work as possible, feigning illness, feigning mental slowness, which you know, then gives rise to uh, they're all stupid. Um, revolting, running away, although those are really extreme and dangerous. Um, and then we have a, you know, a number more, but Christianity was really pivotal, really central. And so, so ultimately a very different meaning of Christianity for the slaves than for their oppressors. In many ways, you know, one can argue almost completely different Christianities. Yes, I would think so, at least from the point of view of the owners. Yeah. So we're out of time. You know, next week is chapter five, which is on uh, the defense of slavery on the eve of the Civil War and, and the Civil War. Um, and what, what's really shocking here is that almost that, that the defense, ideological defense of slavery comes from the church. So does some of the abolition movement, although the abolition movement is both, uh, both Christian and secular. Mm -hmm. And probably, I mean, it's hard to say, but probably in equal measure of both. So in some ways, you know, the, the, the uh, I mean, you know, frequently some of us complain about secular society, but there are often very, very many ways in which secular society is more progressive, more respecting of human dignity than Christianity. And that's, you know, something that uh, should not happen, but does, and 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 it's it's actually it's shocking. <laughs>